Uh, folks, um, now the, the word gold standard has come up a few times this morning, and uh, in terms of honors, um, I've received the gold standard, uh, the chance to um, uh, be one of the folks who says goodbye to John Claybrook uh, as the matriarch of the public interest movement for some four decades. Uh, um, what an honor to be able to introduce her, um, and what an honor it's been to be able to work with her. Um, uh, you know, Joan has been working to uh, help strengthen the rights of whistleblowers before I even heard of the word. Uh, she's such a veteran uh, and champion of the values that um, you folks have lived. Uh, she led Congress Watch, uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, and for the last 27 years, uh, Joan has been the head of Public Citizen. Uh, and the, the perspective that I've maintained on Public Citizen, um, not surprisingly without interruption, is that uh, you're always there, always. Uh, whenever we need uh, reinforcements, when times are desperate, when the, the liberals in Congress are selling us out, <laughs> uh, Public Citizen is there. Um, uh, and it's not just that they're there, um, but that they've been the gold standard for responsible public interest advocacy uh, as long as they've worked on anything. Um, whether it's impeccable, in-depth public policy research, you know, if you're teaming up with public citizen, you've got the best facts. Um, the most recent, the most reliable, and the most powerful. Um, um, or credible relationships with staff. Getting things done in, in Congress, um, it all depends on relationships. Relationships of earned trust. Uh, that's more important than ideology. Uh, and public citizen has decades and decades of accumulated earned trust that pays off in every meeting I attend with their representatives. Uh, professional demeanor. Um, the um, public citizen, Ralph Nader and John Claybrook, they're the, the, the junkyard dogs of uh, consumer advocacy. Um, but uh, civility uh, is uh, the constant standard uh, for um, their approach to advocacy when we're in congressional offices. Uh, and then um, there's a thing that counts the most, access to constituencies. Uh, Nobody has their act together the way public citizen does. Um, yeah, I could, could keep going for a while, um, but this isn't um, um, my moment. This is the time for Joan Claybrook. Um, thank you for leading an all-class operation. We're going to miss you, Joan. I'm just going to say about two words and just thank everybody. I'm really humbled to accept this on behalf of Public Citizen and humbled by the work that all of you do because I know how hard it is to be a whistleblower. We've worked with many whistleblowers in Public Citizen and <clears throat> we've tried to protect their rights, help them through the difficult, horribly difficult uh, stages that they go through in the course of being a whistleblower. And uh, we have also represented in a legal context some whistleblowers. And uh, it's essential that this, these laws be improved and be increased, and we're devoted to doing that, and we're working really hard. Uh, Angela Canterbury, who is uh, the person in our office who's been doing this, can't be here today, unfortunately, to, to greet you all, but several of our other representatives are here, and uh, so she's uh, uh, really so dedicated to this, and so are we, and we will get this law through uh, by hell or high water. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, so much. And our next uh, speaker this morning is uh, Steve Kahn. Steve is uh, president of the National Whistleblower Center. Um, 
uh, and somebody that um, I've been working with for, I think, over 25 years now, one context or another. Uh, Steve's going to be talking about um, the issue that's um, probably our last pitched battle for whistleblower rights, and that's covering the national security employees as part of the overall package uh, for reform. Uh, uh, it's ironic that um, the whistleblowers who, um, uh, whose contribution um, probably would have made the most difference to preventing um, the tragedy that we had uh, at 9-11 uh, have the fewest rights. Uh, and that the most obvious recommendation of the 9-11 Commission for what went wrong was bottlenecks in the flow of information. Um, even within the government, uh, the information couldn't get to the right places. Uh, and that's because the people who know better don't dare <laughs> get it to the right places uh, all too often. Uh, and um, for whatever reason, it's controversial uh, that the government doesn't have control of the evidence and a grasp of the facts they need to know to protect the public. That's controversial for some reason. Um, uh, Steve's going to talk about um, uh, the realities behind those broad brush conclusions that I'm sharing. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, thank everyone for coming and for your care and concern, and I hope to be working with you through the, this campaign, which we will prevail. I've had the honor of representing national security whistleblowers since 1993. When the FBI supervisory agent in charge of securing the first World Trade Center bombing came to my office pleading for help. And it was fairly shocking that in a case of that magnitude, which at the time was the largest international terrorism case in America, and we know what it was the predecessor to, another attack, a war, billions, thousands of dead. We know what it was a predecessor to. When he came, putting his entire career on the line and talking about the most systemic and sometimes just obvious abuses going on in the FBI in the investigation of that case, it was an eye-opener to me because like, whoa, How's that happening in a case like this? I've been representing national security whistleblowers since 1993. Unfortunately, it's not an eye-opener anymore. I have another client that I'm working with now, Mr. Bassam Youssef, the highest ranking Arab American agent at the FBI. The only fluent Arabic speaking agent at his level or higher. Yet he has been banned from using his Arabic language at work. He has faced incredible racism at work. And as he says to me, and is this totally true, if they can't deal with an Arab American agent here in the bureau and work with me, how are they dealing with sources out in the field? Unfortunately, he knows. It wasn't a, Mr. Youssef, and this is pretty incredible, he turned the first recruitment in place in what we now call Al-Qaeda. But he did it in 1994, actually in 1992, before the first World Trade Center bombing, and we didn't, we, the American people, didn't know what we were dealing with. He knew what we were dealing with. And, and a recruitment in place means a high-ranking official moves from their team to our team. And the intelligence was incredible, and he got the highest award from the CIA. 